stuff. Yeah. Yes, Ramesh. Hello and welcome to episode uh, 43 of Guru Mantra. Good evening, namaste, and thank you for joining us uh, for this edition of our series of 50 discussions with educationists and thinkers. Happens every Saturday, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the Guru Mantan talks, as all of you know, uh, are being organized by the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development, We Lead, which is an initiative of the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, as we call it. Uh, we Lead is focused on developing human and social capital for nation building. And this it hopes to do by enhancing the potential of individuals and institutions across four, uh, by engaging across four sectors, the government, NGOs, corporates, and uh, community, with a special focus on the youth. Uh, Guru Mantan is, this, this year, 2020-21, has been an initiative, a platform for teachers to share, discuss, and learn about diverse practices that meet with the who's who of uh, people from across the world. Uh, as always, the format of the talk would be that the guest speaker speaks for 25 minutes, uh, followed by a moderated Q&A, and lastly, uh, followed by closing and concluding remarks by the speaker. Today, it's a pr uh, pleasure and privilege to have uh, with us Professor Usha Raman, Professor, Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad. <clears throat> Her research interests span cultural studies of science, health communication, children's media, feminist media studies, and the social and cultural impact of digital media. She has written for the popular press on a range of topics uh, spanning health, technology, women's issues, education, uh, digital culture, and presently is a columnist for the Hindu, in addition to ed editing a monthly magazine for school teachers called Teacher Plus. Usha received a doctorate in mass communication from the University of Georgia, Athens. Uh, Professor Usha Raman will today uh, will be talking about the classroom as a transformative space and the possibilities of shaping this interactional space in ways that can be liberated for both the students and the teacher. As I said, a pleasure and privilege to have you, ma'am. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramesh, and also Praveen for uh, inviting me. Um, I think I you know, follow a long list of very distinguished uh, speakers. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to be counted among them. Um, and I hope I will uh, be able to engage the audience and um, give them something to think about uh, from based on my own experience. Um, so if you'll give me a minute, I'll just share my screen. Yes, I hope everyone can see it. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you. Um, so when Praveen asked me if I would uh, speak, um, it's always a little bit of a challenge for me because I have to think about, okay, which hat should I put on when I am speaking to this group? And uh, given that uh, SVYM is involved in education, in uh, you know, public health, in a variety of areas, uh, um, I was trying to figure out what would make sense. And um, so I decided that you know, the best way to talk to an audience of teachers, of people who are interested in education is to draw from my own experience as, um, you know, I, I do occupy several worlds, but two of those worlds that are very important to me, uh, both involve education. Uh, one is, of course, my day job at the University of Hyderabad, where I uh, teach media studies and I um, guide students to do research on media and, and communication. Um, but then my not day job, my evening and, and weekends are taken up uh, by editing this magazine. You see a little thumbnail of it here uh, called Teacher Plus. And um, for over 30 years, I've been working with Teacher Plus and I'm really um, committed to the idea of um, education, particularly uh, transforming education through, you know, this agent who is in the classroom day in and day out interacting with uh, children. So, um, so I decided I'll, I'll try and combine these experiences of, have, of running Teacher Plus and of teaching myself um, and see if I could uh, offer something that would make uh, sense to all of you. Um, so I really believe that the classroom is uh, an exciting space. It's a space of transformation. It's a, tra it's a space of possibility. And no matter what the external circumstances are, you know, uh, if there's rain outside, if there's extreme sun outside, if the policy 
uh, environment is not conducive, no matter what that external space is, um, inside the classroom, it is still um, a sacred transaction between this person who is uh, the facilitator of learning, the teacher, and uh, the others who are in that space. So no matter what the age of those students. And I, of course, work primarily with adult learners, uh, young adults uh, in the age of 20 to 25 usually. Um, but of course, I've been in a lot of classrooms with younger learners. So, so possibly what I have to say will apply across both situations. Um, so uh, this is another cover from Teacher Plus magazine. And I, I really like this image because um, I think it shows what all a teacher does, right? Um, and uh, the teacher is positioned in this intersection of policies, of education systems, of boards, um, you know, structures of school, of district um, administrations, various things. Um, and also of spaces, right? So you may be in a large school, a small school, a school which has um, benches, a school that doesn't have benches, um, you know, various kinds of technologies, etc. cetera. Um, but then the, the teacher, I think, is a very important agent within this space. And um, so what I'd like to focus on is really this agency that a teacher has um, in order and, and how she can use this agency to make the classroom a tre truly transformative space. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I'd, I'd just like to start with this quote by Bell Hooks. And every time I read it, I, it re-inspires me. Um, and she says that the classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility. And in that field of possibility, we have the opportunity as teachers to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries to transgress. And I think I'd like us to think a little bit about, you know, what do we mean by uh, transgression? So transgression is not necessarily rebellion, but it is um, a way of pushing boundaries a little bit at a time, you know, um, doing things that perhaps are not ex always expected of the syllabus, of, um, you know, the system and using our power as uh, people with agency to, you know, to, to make little changes uh, at a time. Um, so I see that the teacher, you know, can perform these transgressions or let's call it minor rebellions um, to transform in multiple ways. And um, these ways can happen through uh, creative use of the text. And in, in our case, it's usually a textbook, uh, through creative use of the tools that we have at our uh, disposal. So it could be the Blackboard, it could be now, of course, the, uh, the screen, Google Classroom, Zoom, whatever tools you're using. Um, but then more importantly, I think, um, how do we uh, transgress through talk? Uh, how do we bring in a climate of conversation, of dialogue, in the classroom that allows us to change things. You know, sometimes it's a change of relationship between you and a student. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, other kinds of talk um, in the hallways, in the staff room, et cetera. Um, and then how do we um, rethink the templates that we are given? Uh, we and we are given multiple templates, right? I mean, we're given a classroom that looks a certain way. Uh, we are told that there are structures of relationships within the school that must be a certain way. And there is a template that we are given of our profession. Um, so some of you may have um, you know, been trained through the BEAD system, or if you're a university teacher like me, you have very little training to teach and you kind of learn on the job, but you also see how people um, you know, behave. So you get a kind of template of how to perform as a teacher. Um, and I think this, what, I'm, what I've just jokingly called the T factor, it's transgression and transformations, but through all of these things. Um, and what I'm gonna do is uh, tell you a series of stories um, from my own experience and try and see if we can make sense of them um, and uh, see how each of those has been a kind of transgression, right? 
Um, so I've just given you these little thumbnails and I'll talk a little bit about each of these images as we go along. Um, so the first story is uh, has to do with uh, an exercise that I did in my class. And I teach, one of the courses I teach is a writing class. And um, what I do is I give students uh, a prompt word. And of course, many of you may have heard of this um, kind of assignment. I give them a prompt word and I say, uh, write a 50 word story. And um, some of them enjoy it, some of them don't, but I force, I say, everybody has to do it. Don't put your name on it and um, you know, write your story out. And what we did was we had them posted on the wall. And this is the wall of my classroom. You can see a part of what the students did. And these are all older students, right? They're all 20, 21 year old. So, so asking them to write on colored paper was the first trans, uh, transgression, right? They say like, oh, this is what we did in elementary school. So um, there's immediately a sense of play that comes into it. So anyway, they did write these stories and they put it up on the wall. And I ask all of them to go around and um, make little comments on the stories. Um, now there are no names. So anyone can comment on anyone else's um, story and it's completely anonymous. And you find that a lot of dynamics come to the fore in this exercise. Um, they're thinking about, you know, what does it mean to comment publicly? Um, how, should we be kind? Um, or should we be critical? Um, some people don't feel empowered to comment. And, um, and so then you notice these things and you kind of think about, okay, how do I deal with it in the class? Um, but then there are also, um, you know, the pleasure of being seen, right? So students often don't display their work. Um, and in making them display their work, however reluctantly, they discover that it's actually fun to be read. Um, and, and so, yeah, so there's a kind of transgression going on here. Um, in terms of how one teaches writing. So small story, and we'll come back to it um, in a minute. Um, so the second story that I want to tell is, um, has to do with how do you disrupt spaces? Um, so one of my classes, I asked the students, so, you know, I, I really want to share power, right? And it's, it's very difficult to share power in a classroom, particularly in an Indian classroom, because uh, we're all socialized to see the teacher as a guru, as um, you know, somebody who is the fount of all wisdom and someone who gives you what you should take. Um, so even when I say, okay, you know, let's let's see how we can equalize power in the classroom, students are not very comfortable taking power. Um, so when I ask them this question, how what would make you be a little more proactive in the classroom? Um, one of them said, it's the structure of the classroom. You know, the moment we're inside the classroom, we feel like we have to behave a certain way. We can't ask certain questions. You know, we cannot disrupt the silence. Um, so they said, maybe if we have the class in another space, it would make, a, make us more willing to speak. So, um, so of course, I have the privilege of being in a class in a, in a university that has lots of open space. So um, that semester, we decided that every class we would do in a different place. Um, so we went into the courtyard one day. We went uh, you know, into the bamboo grove one day. And um, in small ways, I found that students were beginning to take a little more responsibility for the dialogue. Um, they were uh, allowing themselves to speak and not necessarily look at the next person to see if someone else is speaking um, and so on. So just disrupting the, the space of the classroom helped. Um, and I've also talked about open books on this slide. And what I mean is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you disrupt the examination system? How do you disrupt the testing um, approach? Um, how do you get them to see that the exam is not necessarily doesn't have to be a source of stress. Now, of course, you know, I can say all this because I am in, again, in a privileged position where my university allows me to do things in a certain way, uh, speak and, um, you know, take control of my own exams, etc. But very often, even when teachers have um, the space, there is a hesitation to take responsibility for that space. So, um, so I think it's important for us to see that uh, where there is control, um, 
you know, can we do something with that control? So, so the second story has to do with disrupting spaces. Um, the third story, again, has to um, a little background about this. Um, so one of the courses that I teach is called uh, uh, Understanding Digital Culture. And um, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, what are selfies? You know, why do people write on social media? What are the politics of social media, et cetera? So that's one part of the class. So one of the things we decided to do for this one course is uh, let's all take selfies. And um, I'm going to make a mug for the class. It was about 25 students. Um, and I wanted them to think about um, how many selfies they took before they decided to send me the picture to use on the mug and think about what were the considerations they applied in order to judge that photograph. So there was a little bit of reflection and thinking through. Um, and then I found that there were three or four students who did not submit a selfie. So I asked them, so what, you know, what do you not want to do this? And they said, no, because we don't want to be represented on a mug um, that someone else is going to have. Um, and so this led to, um, led to a learning for me to not assume that everybody thinks about an assignment or um, an activity that I think of as fun in the same way. So um, how where, do they want to belong to this community of the class? Uh, which lessons do they want to learn and which lessons do they choose to not learn? Um, and I think it's important as teachers that we explore these questions, right? So, so I said, fine, if you don't want to, uh, you know, give me a selfie, that's absolutely fine. Um, but uh, it's important to me that uh, you get something from this class that everybody else is getting. So I made a separate mug for those four students, which just said the unselfie mug. So um, there was a token of my attempt to include them, and they still had the choice to not be included in the way they wanted to. So, so a little bit of uh, a disruption in terms of my own thinking about, you know, I thought, oh, this is such a great fun exercise. And, you know, and then I found that for them, it wasn't necessarily uh, the same kind of uh, you know, feeling. Um, so the next um, story that I have is, uh, you know, many of you may recognize um, the picture or uh, know what it relates to. And um, I, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm from the University of Hyderabad. And in, um, you know, several years ago, there was a student suicide there, uh, which threw up a lot of issues for students um, and, and for faculty. And we had to stop. I mean, for the first time in the history of university, we actually, you know, had no classes for a period of 12 days. And um, rather than just waiting for that moment to pass and go back to classes as usual, um, it was not possible to go back to classes as, as usual. Um, and students had different kinds of questions. So uh, you realize then that the classroom is a space that is occupied by people, right? It's not students, it's not just learners, but those learners, those students come um, from a variety of positions. They represent identities of different kinds. Um, they have different kinds of questions and aspirations and worries and anxieties. And so all of these things came to the fore. To the fore. So while some students were asking the question, how will we catch up? We've lost classes, you know, and their focus was on the academics. There were other uh, students who um, now found that they had the space and the opportunity to talk about marginalizations in ways that they didn't have the opportunity to before. Um, so with the Rohit Vemula su uh, suicide, we were able to actually bring to the fore uh, divisions in the class that had never been uh, acknowledged um, and to uh, deal with them, right? As teachers, as people who are um, working with these young people, not only to give them knowledge, but also to give them the skills to cope with the world that they're going to go out into. Um, so then you realize that the classroom becomes that space, right? It's a safe space where uh, we can find out where people are coming from, uh, try and move them towards um, 
the places that they want to go and not just in terms of knowledge transfer, but also in terms of aspirations about their lives, you know, um, the skills that they need, uh, you know, give them the soft skills that they're all worried about, et cetera. So how do we make the classroom a space where we're not only giving them knowledge, but also um, giving them the context within this knowledge, uh, within which this knowledge works. Um, so that's the fourth um, story. Um, the last story that I wanted to talk about um, is actually not so much about students, but about um, the, the community of teachers. Um, and I think, again, you know, many of you who are teachers will uh, empathize with this. Um, and you find that the, the space of the lunchroom or the staff room um, is um, a space where you can actually get solutions that um, you're muddling through on your own. So, you know, you talk to each other, you share things, you, um, you humanize your profession. And sometimes it's important for students to see you as a community. So I'm sure all of us uh, have been in situations where, you know, students will talk about one teacher in a very individualistic manner. But I think it's important for students to also see that teachers are a community, that they have relationships with each other. So, so in my uh, department, for instance, very often, you know, all of us eat lunch together and students will knock on the door and they'll see us eating lunch together. So I think something happens in that scene of us as a group. Um, and they see us then as human beings who, you know, yeah, they're just ordinary men and women who you know, talk to each other, they're friends, et cetera. Um, and then, um, you know, I have this uh, point here, making visible the gendered aspects of teaching and administration. And this is more about the conversations that we have with each other. So, um, so I, uh, so there are four women in my department and six men. And very often it's during lunch that we talk about how our lives as women and as members of families sometimes um, interferes with our lives as teachers. And I think it's important to have these conversations laterally as well, because um, it, it can resolve a lot of the gender politics that otherwise, um, you know, just get suppressed uh, within systems like schools. Um, so the kind the stories that I'm telling perhaps are just snapshots at the different kinds of disruptions that uh, can happen in, uh, in the classroom and on the margins of the classroom. Um, but what I'm trying to point to is that we need to think about the classroom as our space. And I'm using here a term that um, Prakash Ayer, who's a frequent contributor to Teacher Plus and works at Azim Premji University, he borrows, of course, from um, you know, other writers who've talked about the need for a million mutinies. And, when we think about million mutinies, we also need to think about million micro mutinies um, and the micro ways in which we can um, mutiny, you know, and resist like the oppressions of structure, big structure. Think about what is within our control, our voices, how we speak, how we relate to students, um, you know, what we choose to do in our delivery of syllabus. All of that is within our control. There is more within our control than we often recognize. Um, so by recognizing what is within our control, we can also recognize where we can take control. So there may be times when you, know, you need to seed control. So it's important to develop that um, uh, sense of you know, when is it uh, important for us to assert ourselves and when is it important for us to step back and become part of the larger community. Um, and then I think, um, and this is something that is very important. Um, you know, it's a very important principle for me, both uh, in my work at Teacher Plus and in the university. You know that we value our experience um, and how, and think about how do we productively use that experience. And I know that there are many people who have written about uh, the need for, uh, you know, to be a reflective practitioner. So. What does it mean to be a reflective practitioner? It means that you use your own experience, your own um, understanding of situations to inform your uh, actions. So in a way, what I've done here is to 
show you aspects of my own life as a teacher to demonstrate how I take control, right? How I recognize uh, spaces for control and how I exercise my agency within those situations. Um, and this can only happen if we constantly think about, you know, okay, what did I do today? What went right? What didn't go right? Um, you know, how, why was it that this student was behaving in a certain way and what can I do differently? Uh, or what do I need to probe to understand why they were behaving in a certain way? So, so I think to constantly think about your own experience and uh, see what you can learn from your own experience. Um, the other thing I think is to really be open-minded. And, you know, I've been teaching for 30 odd years. Um, I'm really kind of on the way out of my career. Um, but I still feel every time I go into the classroom, I feel like I'm going to learn something new. Um, that there are these 25, 30, 40 students there who, and each of them has something to teach me. Um, and I know it sounds a little bit, um, you know, cliched, but I think that is, that is what makes teaching so interesting and so um, you know, so important because every day is a new day and every year you see a new group of people. Um, so I will actually stop there um, and um, just, you know, to say finally that this is also how we think about um, Teacher Plus. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, Teacher Plus has been around for now 31 years and um, it's been a struggle because, and in the early days of Teacher Plus, when we started, the idea was we wanted teachers to write about their lives and their experiences. And it was very difficult to get teachers to write. We would get scholars, you know, we would get people who were in um, education uh, colleges or people who are policy makers or, um, you know, professors of education, but we really wanted the voices of teachers. And this was in 1989 when we started. It was like pulling teeth because teachers would say, what do I have to say? You know, I'm just an ordinary teacher. Um, and we would have, it took a lot of work to tell teachers that you are the people, you're the heart of the education system. And so your experience matters. You know, what happens in the classroom matters. Um, your, um, you know, your way of doing things matters. And um, now, you know, 30 years later, I'm really delighted to say that now we actually have more submissions than we can handle. And many of them come from uh, practicing teachers. So, um, so I guess it means that things have changed um, a little bit in the world and teachers are seeing themselves as agents of transformation. Um, but clearly we still have some way to go. So, um, so yeah, but um, yeah, that's my story and I will stop there and um, Happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Professor. I, I just, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the, the very first slide when you spoke about uh, transgression and, uh, you know, when you said, the, when you talked about disruption, uh, I, I come from a marketing management background and one of the, uh, you know, uh, theories that, that are current is about disruptive marketing itself. When essentially, uh, I'm assuming uh, in the marketing management space, you're talking of disrupting marketing as disru disrupting an existing status quo, uh, where where you shake things up a little so that you know there there can there can be newer ideas that come out of the this one, but you, you always ensure that you don't shake it up to such a level that you know the the whole edifice starts to shake. So uh, I, I'm interested to know uh, because. I understand it in that uh, in that space very well. How to do that in terms of uh, branding or bringing something out, but how how do we do that uh, within? Because one of the uh, one of the essential requirements is that teachers have the agency to be able to do that. So the two questions that come to me is: Do teachers really have that uh, in that uh, in that sense? And how do we actually uh, shake things up without you know shaking the very foundations of things? Your thoughts. Um. Yeah. Um, so actually, you know, my point was exactly that, that, you know, it's very difficult to, of course, all of us would like a completely different education system, right? We would like uh, for all our schools to be reinvented uh, in ways that are equitable, just fun, you know, engaging, etc. Um, but then we cannot wait for that to happen. We can't wait for some 
major revolution to happen and for everything to be restructured. Um, so like you say, we need to engage in small acts of um, pushing the envelope, let's say. Um, that doesn't cause the edifice to crumble, but um, changes it sufficiently to uh, make a difference. So, so that is one thing. Of course, you know, we want the system to change, but we know that that big change cannot happen overnight. Um, and maybe what is needed is small incremental change. And before we know it, things would have, you know, all changed. Um, the second thing is that about agency, and I think these two questions are very closely related. And I think teachers, the popular imagination of the teacher um, has worked itself into the minds of people who become teachers. And so they don't see themselves as powerful individuals. So if you think about you know, who's powerful in society, you think about politicians, you think about businessmen, you think maybe about you know, very successful journalists, you think about policymakers, but you don't think about teachers. But then if you ask each one of us, you know, who has influenced you? I think in a, in a room of 100 people, you'll find at least 10 to 15 who will mention a teacher. Um, and that's 10 to 15 more than zero, right? Um, and I think teachers have more power than they actually uh, recognize. Um, and that power is often used for not for very good reasons. I mean, very often we don't, rec we don't recognize the power, therefore we abuse it. Um, so we say things to children that shouldn't be said. Um, so that's, that is an exercise of power. So what I'm saying is if we recognize that power, then maybe we will not say the things that we've been saying all along and instead saying, say better things, right? Um, so this recognition, all of us have agency. But we give up that agency because we look at structure and say, oh, we can't change structure. So we, I don't have agency. But the important thing is to recognize the spaces where you do have agency and apply it there. Okay. I just have a follow up on that. Uh, you know, um, uh, again, if, you know, going back to my marketing management example is that uh, one, one is when, uh, you know, marketeers disrupt the market. And there are times when the market disrupts the entire uh, marketing management system itself. And when I look at COVID, I think uh, there's a question as well, uh, is that, you know, it's like the market has disrupted the, uh, the management uh, itself in, in the sense, the way it's, uh, you know, it's, it's shaken up in, in a sense, the, stat, uh, uh, the, the, the very, uh, you know, the, the assumptions that we've had about how schools would function and all of that. So in, in that light, I know I know you touched upon it, uh, upon it very briefly about how children have uh, you know started to react and all that. Uh, is is that what what are your uh, general thoughts? I think uh, you, you know I have a feeling that you know uh, given t uh, most institutions as well as teachers have struggled to uh, come to terms with it, but we seem to be getting uh, getting a hold of this. But just your thoughts on how things have shaped out and how they're going to go forward. It's very hard to say, right? And also there cannot be one answer because um, um, everywhere, not just in India, um, there's no one kind of school and there's no one kind of teacher or one kind of student. Um, so I think, um, you know, on a macro level, of course, it's been extremely disruptive. Um, but uh, the resilience that different groups and individuals have to deal with that disruption is going to be very different, the levels of resilience. So, um, so I don't know that I can give an answer that is like, that is generalizable. Um, but I think certainly what has happened is that uh, on the one hand, it's, um, it's a disruption that has forced us to look at uh, who we are as teachers, what we do as teachers, uh, what have structures meant, uh, what have structures not meant. I mean, you know, we suddenly realize that we can do a lot without, you know, the enforced discipline of a classroom. But we've also discovered which elements of that enforced discipline are necessary. Um, so I think what it will take is for us to really, you know, think hard about, um, you know, to try and separate the elements that have led to learning from the elements that have only you know, been there for because we're used to them. 
um, and then see if we can use this moment of disruption to reinvent our classrooms or the relationships that we have in the classroom um, based on this learning. So I know, I mean, I'm, I seem to be talking a little bit in the air, um, but um, I don't think we're reflecting sufficiently on that. You know, all of us are bemoaning the fact that, oh, children are out of school and, you know, staring at a screen is uh, problematic and teachers are fatigued because they're sitting at home. So we're talking about all of these extraneous things. They're important, not to say that they're not important, but we're still not talking about that teaching learning compact and what is happening there. And, um, you know, suppose the pandemic was taken away. Suppose the anxieties of the pan pandemic were taken away then what do we have to work with? Um, you know, what are the things that we need to think about that worked and didn't work? Right now, I think we're all preoccupied with the anxieties of the pandemic. So it's very difficult for us to actually see, um, you know, what elements we can take from this experience that will actually serve us well in a post-pandemic era. So um, one, like, you know, one of my students recently uh, told me, you know, I. I'm normally a very good student. I keep up with uh, assignments and, you know, I've never fallen back, but now I sit down to write and I can't think of anything because I'm constantly worried about, will I get a job after I finish? Is my grandfather going to be okay tomorrow? So, so yeah, so those are things that are interfering now. Uh, and therefore I cannot give him a good answer, but suppose those things were not there. How would I then say, okay, you're still distanced, you're not here, but you don't have those anxieties. Now, what will work and what will not work? I think that's how we have to think about it. Thank you, ma'am. There are several questions in the chat box. I'll try to club them together. Uh, a couple of teachers have made two interesting uh, comments. Uh, you, you spoke about how the journey of uh, Teacher Plus over three decades and your interactions with teachers. So one of the questions was, uh, do you think new generation teachers are more flexible, open-minded and receptive to change? And a contrasting question to that by another teacher in the audience is, uh, do, do you think there is a sufficient uh, respect for the profession as compared to where it, what it was uh, a few years ago and what role do teachers have with respect to that? Uh <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of generations, you know, I, I don't know where I belong, right? I mean, I'm 60 years old, so clearly I'm in the old generation, um, but I don't feel old. Um, and um, so I think it's very hard to say that, you know, one generation of teachers was less open-minded than another generation of teachers. What I can say is that, you know, as we pro Again, I hesitate to use words like progress, but as we've moved, you know, from let's say the 60s to today, um, we're certainly much more exposed to a lot more information. So the average 21 year old who is entering a B.Ed. college today has the opportunity to learn, to understand a lot more about society and culture than a 21 year old who entered B.Ed. college in the 1960s. So by that very token, one would expect that the 21 year old today would be more open-minded, maybe not open-minded, but more equipped to understand um, you know, diversity and the needs of different kinds of students. Um, but having said that, I don't know if being more informed and being more exposed is necessarily the same as being more open-minded. Um, I think those things are very different and very often the more uh, learned you think you are, the less open-minded you are. Um, so I don't know that we can make that difference across generations. It's probably an individual trait. Um, I think we certainly have the tools to be more open-minded now, but whether we use those tools to actually be open-minded and inform ourselves is another question, right? I mean, we all know about filter bubbles and echo chambers and all that. So those are a function of not being open-minded. Um, so what do you say about that? Um, in terms of the second question about whether teacher, teachers have, the position of teachers or the perception of teachers has changed in society. 
I don't, I'm at the university level, certainly, but school level, I think there's a great variation. Um, even today, if you ask, um, you know, the average middle class uh, family, what do you want your children to be? They will still say doctor, engineer, accountant, lawyer, uh, and teacher will be fairly low on the uh, ladder. University professor, okay. But school teacher, less so. And that's something that really requires, I think, a societal policy level push to change. Um, the only place in the world where it is prestigious to be a school teacher is in the Nordic countries, right? I mean, that's the only place where you'll see that a teacher is equated with other movers and shakers of society. In India, we still pay lip service, but we don't um, give teachers that position. Another, know, it's a cynical answer, <laughs> but still. Yeah. Another question with respect to the trends part. Uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, very frequent complaint that reading is generally coming down. But at the same time, it's a reality that access is actually improving. So uh, have you seen uh, readership uh, uh, with Teacher Plus as an example? Have you, sh have you seen readership and participation uh, increase and uh, how, how, what are the trends that you have seen with respect to teachers? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because we generally think of uh, a decline in reading and we think of, we imagine it in relation to books, right? We say, okay, people are reading fewer books. They don't buy books like they used to or they don't sit with a book like they used to. Um, but at the same time, if you think of what young people are doing, apart from looking at pictures and scrolling, uh, you know, on Instagram or whatever else, they are reading, right? They are they're reading in different ways. Maybe they're reading shorter texts, but I think they still are reading. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a kind of uneven thing. So I have a student, a, a very bright uh, PhD student, who tells me that she is not a reader, yet she is somebody who I have seen, you know, can consume large amounts of very complex text and understand it and, you know, assimilate and synthesize. But she doesn't call herself a reader. So what does that mean, right? So it means that she doesn't read as a hobby, but she still has the capacity to read. So I don't know that I completely understand it when we say people are not reading anymore. Maybe we've, you know, things are changing in a way that we are assimilating information in new ways. And maybe it doesn't need to be through text or through pages, printed, you know, material. Um, maybe, you know, watching, a, you know, let's say an explainer video um, can be just as engaging and time consuming as reading a thousand word article. Um, so I, I, I would hesitate to dismiss uh, the capacity of young people today just by saying they don't read. Um, but in relation to Teacher Plus, um, I have a problem there. I think the teachers and, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm completely willing to be corrected by this audience. I think teachers don't read sufficiently. You know, once they get into the job, um, I think the pressures of the work or, you know, having to read and grade 150 notebooks, maybe that. But Teacher Plus subscription has not grown at all. You know, it's been static in the past five, six years. And um, I don't know. I mean, it costs less than the price of a sari, yet teachers don't subscribe. So I don't know if it's because they have too much to read and they don't want something more or... Yeah. Sorry about that plug. Yeah. Great. Uh, one question related to uh, a comment which you made uh, during the presentation. Uh, uh, Satish sir uh, has, has said that teachers should not have power or authority. We need teachers who have authenticity. Can you share your thinking on this? Yeah, so um, I think we can think about authority and power in both positive and negative ways, right? I mean, 
And I guess the way I'm using the word power is um, we all have power. So when you talk about agency, what is agency but the recognition of the presence of power um, of a certain kind? So if you, if you can stretch your hand out and pick up a glass of water, that is a certain kind of power. So, um, so I would say that, uh, of course, we teachers should have authenticity, but that authenticity also requires the power to express that authenticity, right? And to exercise that authenticity in some way. And that is the kind of power I'm talking about. Um, so if you, so, you know, we talk about people being genuine, but very often not everybody has the luxury to be genuine. So, or the space, or and that's the agency. So, uh, what I'm saying is that it's important for us to recognize that uh, ability to exercise power and use it in the small ways that we can. Um, not against authenticity. Of course, we want authenticity, but that there's a relationship between, you know, the ability to be authentic and having power. Yeah, so it's, I guess it's a more philosophical discussion, but uh, yeah, that's how I would see those things. I request Sati sir to just uh, quickly uh, add. Uh, uh, just I want to add a point here, um, maybe mm -hmm. for a debate. <clears throat> yes, teachers uh, need to cause uh, little mild mutinies within their space of the classroom. Unfortunately, education system, the structures within the system are hierarchical, highly hierarchical. And the, it's a hierarchical system where some people have more power than the other. And the people in high, higher positions of power don't want the people in the lower order to be empowered. And therefore, any positive change that we expect in terms of transformation in the classroom should come from the classroom practitioners. That means empowering the people who are in direct contact with the students, who are in direct contact with the reality, should have their voice heard by the structure, the system, and the people in power. See, for example, many committees are formed where teachers are also made members, but that's only a token. That's only a token. Uh, as a teacher, I myself have experienced in many uh, such programs, the voice of the teacher is either snubbed or curtailed or that space is not given because we still believe that wisdom lies at the top. No argument with that. I mean, I, I agree completely that um, some people are in a position of, um, you know, they hold power and uh, they um, also hold the means to distribute power. So, um, and in a society like ours, which is extremely hierarchical, um, people don't want to give up that power. So, uh, you know, th that's the situation we're in. I completely agree. Um, which is why I think um, we cannot wait for somebody else to empower us. Um, because people who have power are not like it too much to give it up. Um, so instead, I would say, let's see, you know, where it is we do have power. And I would argue that we actually do have power in many places, small amounts of power, perhaps, but we do have it. And can we find ways to exercise it? Um, and this is a question for everybody in their individual lives, right? So, because again, circumstances vary. So, and, but we also read stories about the people who have been in extremely oppressive conditions and who have been able to uh, somehow to transcend those conditions. So uh, I'm not saying that each one of us should overthrow institutions. I'm just saying, can we, like, you know, when we grade a student, can we also put in a kind remark there? Um, yes, the institution requires us to put down marks and to, um, you know, pin them down in certain ways. But can we do something that also 
makes you know a little bit of difference in that micro space is what i'm suggesting but yes of course everything you're saying is completely true thank you I just have a question uh, you know that's completely different from the current uh, and what we've been discussing so far i also know that you uh, teach media studies I, I'm just wondering uh, within in, in the uh, Indian uh, you know the mainstream media existed for a long time, but it's being challenged by the uh, the social media and other spaces where uh, you know and and we have we have these issues of fake news, we have issues of all of these things. And I, I see that a lot is being uh, done to make this part of the curriculum in, in the Western uh, academic circle. Uh, I, I just wanted to have two separate uh, ideas from this because uh, I think this is a very important uh, subject that needs that uh, you know uh, young people as well as teachers need to engage with them. Do you see uh, more children as well as teachers engaging with the, the topic of uh, media studies here? Because I, I'm assuming that I, I'm I'm thinking that there's not much happening in that front. And just what are your thoughts on that? Um, in fact, there's, I mean, there's an argument that's being made um, in a lot of countries um, by those who deal with um, curricula and uh, education that uh, media critical media literacy should be an essential part of uh, school curricula. Um, and um, part of critical media literacy is, of course, the ability to uh, one, to use media responsibly, but also to be able to deconstruct what you read, you know, to know that uh, simple things now, of course, we're all being told, right? So if you get a WhatsApp message that says forwarded, you know, you need to pay attention to where it was forwarded from, check the source, etc. If it's something that's been forwarded many times, um, again, you, know, you need to think about it. It's not coming directly from the source. So, I mean, those are small things, but... Uh, um, or to know that there are fake news sites that can check information if you submit it to them and so on. Um, and these are things that have become even more important today because when you're faced with something like a pandemic, it's important that the information you get is good information and authentic information. So critical media literacy uh, has become a lot of people who are framing curricula are saying it, it should be introduced right from... Um, you know, elementary school itself. Um, we don't, uh, we have quite a few scholars in India who are working on media literacy and trying to advocate for, um, you know, media literacy to be included as part of curricula. Plus there are also a lot of efforts by like UNICEF, people like that to add it on, um, you know, outside the school system. Um, so, I mean, as somebody who teaches media studies, I think it's absolutely important that this becomes um, a life skill because we're in such a media saturated world, right? Even our social relationships are mediated. Um, so what does it mean when you say, oh, I have, you know, 500 friends on Facebook? Um, is that, what is the nature of that friendship? I think it's important for young people to interrogate these things and know how to make sense of it and sometimes they are better teachers to us than we are to them but maybe young people also can be part of these media literacy efforts that's what um, i think is the current thinking just a quick uh, follow-up question on that ma'am um, many times we term facebook and twitter and instagram as distractions uh, for today's uh, students uh, have you come across any uh, experiments where they have been used as tools inside a classroom in a school environment? Uh, um, there are, uh, there is work on, um, so now, especially during the pandemic, uh, there's now a lot of work being done, for instance, on things like TikTok, uh, Instagram Reels, uh, et cetera, on how class teachers are incorporating them into their uh, uh, you know, into assignments and so on. Um, in India, there hasn't been any large scale systematic work, but um, um, there's, um, there is something that is, there's a global project called Global Kids Online, um, which is um, directed by, uh, you know, it's a collaborative project and uh, 
the uh, London School of Economics and uh, Politics has um, a person there, so Sonia Livingston, who's been arguing quite vociferously for the integration of media into children's. I mean, we know that children are already using these media, you know, a lot. So why don't we find ways to, um, to productively engage them? So there is work going on, but off the top of my head, I can't, you know, cite anything specific. Um, but I know that teachers, like in Teacher Plus itself, we've carry, we've had a special issue on uh, using uh, digital tools in the classroom. And teachers have talked about how they have done it uh, in small scale within their own classrooms, um, either to produce, let's say, you know, small audio notes, um, instead of writing an assignment, uh, create an audio note on your phone and send that. Um, so it makes the students think about articulation. It makes them think about, um, you know, the order of words, etc. So um, there are teachers who are using it, but we don't need more. We need to integrate all that knowledge together. And uh, being uh, in the Department of Communication, we, we do emphasize a lot on the importance of communication inside a classroom. But most of the times, communication is sort of interpreted to be only the verbal communication or it is restricted to the verbal communication uh, have we been uh, or have, have you come across any experiments where we have actually expanded the definition of communication and uh, how important is it uh, to be made of a part of the teacher training process or an induction program into the teaching uh, profession I think in some ways it already is, right? I mean, when we talk about, uh, I think if you look at uh, uh, teacher training, um, there's already a lot of emphasis on uh, teaching style and uh, how you articulate, you know, how do you hold yourself? I th so I think in some ways it's already there. Um, and teachers also learn on the job, you know, what works, what kind of modulation works, what doesn't, what conveys assertiveness, what conveys uh, meekness. Um, but maybe you're right, we do need a more um, explicit kind of module on communication styles. Uh, right now, it's kind of implicit in the training. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think we can move to your final uh, closing um oh so i make the closing remarks yes yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> okay um yeah i i mean i i guess uh, what i would say is that um uh, you know it's very easy to be cynical and very easy to shift responsibility from ourselves to the system to the structures to the things that um, um inhibit us or that challenge us but i think it's important for us to um, you know, to find small ways and take joy in those small ways um, and not look for, um, to overcome huge challenges. So, um, you know, just today I um, finished writing an essay where I was talking about productivity and very often as teachers, we, uh, how do we estimate our productivity, you know, in terms of past percentages or number of first classes uh, that we've uh, produced or, you know, if you're in a university, how many papers have you written? Um, but I think it's important for us to, you know, to really think about productivity in more human terms and to say, okay, you know, did I make a student smile today? Did a student who got, you know, 2.5 on the last test get four today, you know? So set very, set kinder targets for ourselves and, um, you know, to, to also look at our own experience as a source of wisdom. So I will end there. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. A couple of questions on how to subscribe to Teacher Plus. Um, the website is uh, www.teacherplus.org. Uh, the subscription uh, tab is there. So, or just send an email to me, usha at teacherplus.org. Great. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be with, uh, with us and uh, sharing your uh, thoughts. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we'll have slightly higher number of readers than we what we have today. <laughs> and, and I'm hoping that it's not just about the reading, but the reflection part, which you did uh, talk about. So next week, we will take it to the next level. Dr. Neeraja Raghavan will be talking about reflective uh, teaching. 
uh, she is the founder director of a, uh, an organization called the thinking teacher and she was also the former professor at dazim premji university uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining the session today and thank you ma'am once again uh, for the wonderful uh, session have a good night and stay safe